I uh, followed your layout for um, the learning objectives in the notes. And um, I basically have, uh, you know, everything ready to go so we can get, we can get started. Um, chapter four of geocomputation with R is um, a uh, extension really of uh, chapter three, where we did a lot of the uh, same the same operations and everything, but uh, not not really doing them spatially, you know, doing the joins and and the subsets of of attribute data and such. So this builds this builds off of a lot of what was done in in chapter three, but also um, adds uh, the spatial component to it uh, on uh, vector and raster data. So, so I made two uh, I, I made two learning objective slides. I kind of you know broke it down to you know what we'll cover on the spatial operations for for vectors, and um, that'll be you know subsetting and joining uh, data spatially. And uh, you know, as I as previously mentioned, a lot of equivalence to uh, some of the same stuff that was done in uh, in chapter three, um, and then it'll it'll kind of focus on um, the way to do spatial spatial joins on um, the uh, vector data. Um, some of the key points of of that section will cover uh, intersections and. Um, this distance related uh, spatial uh, spatial uh, queries or joins or subsetting um, and the um, the uh, simple features is a is a big component of of what's going to be covered in the uh, in the spatial uh, in the vector section using simple features and um, you know basically the you know, similar concept of, you know, subsetting data, um, you know, filtering basically, you know, taking a, a subset of a data set, um, you know, in, with reference to um, a spatial, <clears throat> a spatial component. So it'll focus on, you know, starting, starting with an object and then basically, you know, doing some spatial operation and seeing how that object relates to uh, other spatial, uh, other um, you know objects nearby it, and you know um, the within, the, you know the near, basically all, all the different uh, iterations that uh, will be covered in terms of uh, spatial subsetting. We'll we'll go through in the uh, in the vector component, and then the uh, the raster component will be the other. Uh, component of the chapter, and it'll basically, you know, focus on uh, using the the Terra package mostly, and um, you know, simple simple features and and Terra. They were you know also touched upon in uh, chapter three. So same same packages we used again uh, as we go through as we go through chapter four. So. On the raster side, we'll be doing things with, you know, subsetting via clipping, subsetting via um, masking, and um, doing a logical, um, you know, true-false against the against the layer, and using that as a mask for 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 another layer, and um, that, <clears throat> you know, that <clears throat> that'll cover um, what they call uh, map map algebra and different uh, subclasses, uh, the local, the focal, the zonal, and the global method will be the key focus of um, the, uh, the raster section. And um, the, you know, the book, the chapter, the book author tries to um, basically uh, give you a comparison between the raster map algebra operation and and what their equivalent vector uh, processing counterpart is. So uh, I tried to kind of you know summarize that uh, when we get down to that section. And then there was some uh, there was some component uh, discussion on uh, merging merging rasters as well, which will also be uh, you know one of the key um, 
components uh, for the uh, raster spatial operations as well. So that's what I took as you know the two different uh, categories: vector, vector, and raster, and what I considered the you know the learning objectives to get to get out of the chapter. So I'll pause there if there's any uh, opening comments or discussion, and if not, I'll uh, you know kind of get into the the meat of the chapter. Okay, all right. So if we go to um, um, the vector, start, starting with the uh, spatial subsetting, and um, basically uh, the the concept here, the concept here was that you could subset and um, you know look for the relationship in space uh, between between objects. So the the scenario presented in the book was a was a point was a point in polygon uh, in intersection basically. And um, they focused on using the um, you know X and you know X being the point and does it you know does it intersect uh, say layer Y or, or the polygon? And they gave an example of just using the, the square bracket operator notation. And the default um, of this function for intersects is, um, well, that is the default, basically. So if you don't specify the, the operation, you always get uh, an intersection uh, as, as the default. So uh, if you want something other than that, you have to you have to specify it. And um, an example of specifying something other would be um, a disjoint, ST underscore disjoint, meaning you want the stuff, the points that do not intersect or, or the X that does not intersect the Y. You know, again, it's, this is the point, the point polygon example that was given, that was given in the book. So, um, the um, intersect, right? I guess by by default, you know, intersect kind of is is a catch-all that talks about whether something you know touches, crosses, or or falls within, uh, you know. And then, obviously, if it's not going to touch, cross, or fall within, you know, you would specify the operation and say you want the you want the disjoint. And that would give you what doesn't what doesn't intersect. So um, the the book example um, again was focusing on uh, points points and polygons using this uh, this New Zealand uh, map data, and they had a bunch of um, high points that were above a above a certain elevation. I believe was was what the point features were, and then. The intersects was does it intersect the polygon layer of a region of New Zealand called uh, Canterbury? So the the what the picture on the right is after the is after the spatial subset is done. You see you have more points you know all over New Zealand, but after you do the does it intersect touch cross you know, fall within the polygon boundary for Canterbury, you get the uh, you get the relationship on the right, and it basically you know spatially subsets or filters out the points that fall in the uh, in the other region. So um, I found this to be like you know a very deep dive explanation into a basic function that. You know, I, I use all the time with with GIS applications, and you know, just doing, you know, does does my data fall within, you know, um, my polygon? So it was a, uh, you know, just something that uh, was a, you know, pretty thorough uh, explanation of of how it's actually done using using these packages and and everything for a simple feature that you just invoke. 
you know, pretty much, uh, you know, as just a matter of course of doing work with, uh, you know, ArcGIS. Uh, but that's basically a, uh, a spatial, uh, a spatial subset example. So moving, moving on, if uh, no, no questions or comments or discussion points, then we'll go into what they call the. Uh, 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 even if you, I mean, like, yeah, I, I, I get your point, like, but even if, for example, like uh, you said, like, it's true that it's kind of the basic of GIS, like we do that all the time. But it's good, like, I think for students to go, like, in an example, like, very, 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 uh, like, uh, righted, let's say. <laughs> so they can understand, like, how it works. Like, basically, it's first, it's going to check uh, every um, uh, point that's over. And then it will re re get only, like, the ones that are overs to return something. So it's it's even if it's like very very I mean I agree with you like maybe like they spend too much time on it, but I think on another part a student need to understand that well because it will be like it's bread and butter for a long long time. I don't know if it's bread and butter is the correct word, but like uh, yeah, it will be it will do it a lot a lot a lot and a lot. And sometimes you know uh, we misunderstood it. So, yeah, exactly. Just just understanding, you know, um, how it's implemented in various, you know, G GIS tools and everything. I'm sure it's, you know, very similar to, you know, if not using, you know, just the same packages under the hood, you know, if, yeah. if uh, you know, S, uh, was it S SF or um, Terra, you know, or, or, you know, part of the, uh, the commercial products or not, but I'm sure it's you know doing something very similar to you know get the intersections of uh, points of polygons but like this example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's probably like the yeah, the, let's say the cookie cutters or like the very. Uh, I mean, this is like the basic example that everyone at least need to know. <laughs> yeah, I think. And then uh, you know the next section of vectors went into. Uh, topological uh, relations or binary binary to topological uh, relations um, where it does a logical uh, true false and um, here it focused on you know understanding that it's uh, an ordered ordered set of points and sometimes sometimes the order does matter so um, they had, you know, basically uh, symmetrical, symmetrical relationships and and non-symmetrical relationships. So, you know, when it's symmetrical, something, you know, um, intersects, crosses, touches, or overlaps, and you know, it it will in in either direction. The the x the x y intersect or the y x intersect will will be the same. Uh, for a symmetrical relationship, but you know, then it focused on you know some of the more complex examples with um, contains and and within, and you know basically told you that here the order of you know of how you query um, will be will be different between you know the the, uh, the container within because it's not it's not a symmetrical uh, relationship. So they gave some examples here with, uh, you know, an A and a B or an X and a Y data set and, and talked about um, um, what, what I kind of, um, you know, didn't do too, too deep a dive on was all these uh, um, DE9IM, the, the string relationships and, you know, the orders and the codes here. That, that was a little bit, um, you know, I felt a little too deep, a little too deep for me to be trying to talk about how, what's actually going on there. So um, I didn't make that a focus of the uh, of the discussion. So I don't know if anybody, you know, utilizes this in their work or, you know, yeah. deals deals with uh, 
Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm using it, but uh, I'm also responsible of uh, helping Robin on writing that. So, yeah, I, I, I have done a lot with it, but like it's true, like it depends of your question you want to answer. Like sometimes you, for example, want an example, uh, a case is like, um, so the idea of the GE. Nine, uh, nine Y M mattresses is like sometimes uh, uh, a, so yeah. First, you need to understand like a points uh, line and a polygons have different kind of dimension. A point basically and the line, um, a points have no dimension; it have no surfaces. And the line uh, have a have a distance, have a, but have no surfaces, and the polygon have everything. So uh, a point can touch uh, another point. A point can touch a line on its um, on its like uh, path, let's say, and a point can be inside of a polygon. But when you check a polygon, a point can be either fully inside of it, on the line, or that set. And this is basically what the example here like is. Uh, let's say like the example like you show. The on the middle on the bottom. If you take the triangle, you have only one point uh, just on the middle. <laughs> the other one here, like you have basically one point where like the um, poly, uh, the the triangle in, interact with the um, the line of the polygon, the orange spaces. Mm -hmm. So if you have like question like that, uh, you know, like if you want to know uh, if a like uh, a point or uh, not a point, but like a, a vertex, a vertices. I don't know if you pronounce like a nodes in a polygon want to interact with like, let's say not the whole polygon, but just uh, the line of it. This came handy. And then they show how you can do it. Like this is the example of the queen and rock example in the book i don't know if you remember so this is like the the, the chess pieces mm -hmm. like uh if you use the queen move basically you you do not want the basically like the the queen can go everywhere but if you take the rock it can only go where you have length so mm -hmm. you exclude in the predicate the cases where interact with just one point right mm -hmm. yeah this is here yeah, yeah. So you see with the rock, like normally, like you have like these uh, places uh, on the other corners, let's say, and you, for whatever reason, you do not care if it just connect by one point, you want a, a, a connection that uh, have a distances. So this is where like uh, this um, D and E nine Y M matrices. <laughs> uh, come into play like if you have some question uh where you need to test that you can set up the full pattern which is the pattern inside of the um, you can basically like write the pattern and they show it on the book or to write the pattern uh and yeah you basically like uh, i don't remember where it is i do not remember the pattern by um but it's basically like you can code uh every kind of connection it has like does it connect or not? Does it connect by a surface or does it connect by a point? And every one of these criteria can be coded as a basically a string of nine pattern. And it's very useful uh, if you have like specific question on big data set like that, because it saved a lot of memory. It's very uh, memory efficient. Okay. And it does. But it's, it's say... a specific question. I agree. Yeah, and it does say if you want to like, you know, come up with your own logic, then you would, you know, you would use this to. Yeah, you can use this is the pattern like you basically uh, use like the function st relate, and then you can encode the pattern uh, specifics that you want. But mm -hmm. I agree with you like it's, uh, it's useful in a very specific specific cases. So and but and. and by the way, like uh, the STD join, ST intersect, et cetera, et cetera, are all um, 
wrappers of the ST um, relates with the pattern. So, you know, like at, at the bottom of it on the theory, it's all these matrices and all the string, all the, this is the same ID inside, like we do not care to remember, like, let's say like that this join is FF2, FF1212. <laughs> so we this join make more sense. I don't know for you, but like, and F, I don't remember the order of the string, but F probably is false, false. It need to be connected on. So, and it's probably, if I remember correct, correctly, it's interior, exteriors, and something like that. Anyway, but yeah. yeah. So that's it. I don't know if others like have experience with it, but yeah, I have used them a lot. Yeah, this was this was my first time seeing all that. <laughs> said yeah it's I'm not i'm not going to be able to teach anybody that stuff it's it's <laughs> it's very no you don't need to teach you need just to remember <laughs> that it exists that's it right <laughs> the, the wikipedia link that they hit from the book had a pretty good explanation i thought yeah yeah those those strings i was wondering if anybody can explain the difference between contains and covers i'm confused about that over here we should check the, apparently there are this we should check the um, gf matrices so did you check like for example two one two one two f zero so there is a zero so you have like a contain is uh you have the ge nine m matrix strings on the contain and uh, on the covers and if you check uh, let me check see like f it will be false on the zero here. So I just need to Google it to remember, but the difference is here. Let me check that quickly. Uh, so uh, the uh, nine Y M matrices. Yes. And content covers. So contain will be like remember. So let me. Uh, have, I'm just on the Wikipedia, but yeah, you can check. There is uh, covers is way more scenario of it. I need to remember what's the order of the matrices. Okay, it's interior, boundary, exteriors. Uh, maybe maybe I can share my screen. No, do you want? Sure. Hold on one second. I, I will share quickly. So, but I agree. Like it's it's very specific. But this is why like it's good to understand this uh, DE nine YM matrices. It's have another name. Like I think this is a, a, a an Italian researcher, if I'm correct. So we can use this name. <laughs> maybe I will share my screen. Uh, well, yeah. Sure. Should have an easier to pronounce name. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> anyway, so contain is that. So if you check here, you see like uh, it's entire boundary exteriors and entire boundary exteriors. So contain take and the star is basically it can be whatever. It's uh, a flag for. So contains need to be true. It need to be true on. Interior and interior, it does not care about the rest except FF. It's in on the exterior. It needs to be true on interior, exterior, and boundary exteriors. We should we should have printed like do an example. The interiors intersect on the yeah. Exterior doesn't intersect with yeah. the interior. And then uh, for like the covers. It you have way more option like well this is symmetric so this one and this one could be like the same like the you know this one and this one so the false always I mean like the the last row is always the same and it's what defined basically like kind of the covers but uh, contain will be true if it's like just the boundary. While I think covers, I, no, contents will be true for like the um, interiors. 
while covers, if it just interacts, like let's say you have like, um, you have like, uh, you know, like uh, let's say a reverse and it does the reverse and it just like go into the reverse. Uh, but you know, the reverse, uh, it will work with cover where it will not work with contain. I think this is my understanding because here you see like it's all covers also accept that uh, the boundary matches while um, contain does not allow that. So it's 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 a narrow cases, but sometimes it's important when you uh, when you use this a con. The, it's what happens on the boundary. Yeah, like a just, point which just appeared on the boundary of a polygon would be covered by the polygon. It, but it not could happen. By it. Yeah, if you, for example, let's say like you have a polygon with a. Uh, Let's say a field. I think we should we should try. I do not have time to build the example, but uh, if we let, let's say have a, a random field that have a reader as that a river. The river is bigger than the field. I think if you are using contain, mm, no, it will work too. I think it will work too because like uh, it's a wild character. Yeah? It's a it's a star, so it it can. Yeah, we should try. Good question. I think it will work. Uh, I think covers define uh, can be more specific, I while contain is general. Yeah, I think the B has to be a point or a line in order for them to be different. Yeah, I think if A is a polygon and B is a polygon, they're the same. But if B is a point or a line on the just on the boundary of A. And they're different. Yeah. yeah, we should test it because I think like cover accept all of these cases. And when we check all of these cases, you basically are very close to contain. So it's depend on cover is implemented. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I, I will check later, but it's a good question. See, that's why the matrices is important because at the end, what you want to check is that you want to know like uh, what does uh, it does exactly. And you want to avoid like the where cases, like uh, for example, like this case of the field with the rivers, obviously the field does not uh, contain the river, but it covers it. <laughs> and it can all, uh, and in some cases, uh, does you want your covers to be just by a point or does you want your covers like, you know, like to, <coughs> to have some, uh, some distances. But good question. Thanks. I, I'll let you go. Okay. okay. Uh, back to, let's see, where were we? Yes. Okay. So moving on to uh, uh, space, spatial joins, um, they use the, uh, the ST join here. Um, so um basically the the um left join is is the default so all all from x all from x left uh and then there's a let's see the default is a left join and you could do an inner join by by setting left uh left equal to false so default join is uh intersects and you can change the uh, you could change the join argument. So, um, figure figure four six was used um, for um, points points with polygons that that are within. So the example there, and I think I have it uh, just to just jump back and forth to it. But it was the uh, they selected they selected random cities. Um, uh, around the world, and then they looked for where the uh, where the points intersected the uh, uh, certain uh, polygons. There, Let's just bring that up uh, for the four six picture here. 
So they had selected some uh, random cities to, to get the points. And then they looked for, they had a set, set of selected polygons here. And it was kind of similar to the, to the other example. It's the point, it's the point intersecting the, the polygon. So the end result is just the random points that happen to be in these, uh, was it five or four, four um, country polygons that they, that they highlighted here. So, um, let's see, uh, random points, yes. Uh, and then they did a, a non-overlapping join example here with using within within a certain distance. So I think this was a little bit, the uh, next example was with the, um, what was it, the, the bike, the bike hire things where um, there was, you know, because it was from, because it was from two different, um, two different data, data sources, they weren't exact, you know, the, um, what was it, it was um, bi bike rental shops and um, distribution of cycle hire points uh, and, um, Open Open Street Map data. So the coordinates were just a little bit different from where the the City of London said their bicycle points were located, and where um, you know where the uh, actual map point was. So nothing actually um, intersected. So by doing the query and saying within you know within a certain distance, um, they were able to uh, you know get get a join and um show which ones you know were really within i think they used like 20 uh 20 20 meters or something like that so that was the example for um another store another sort of sp spatial join where um the point has to be within a certain distance of of the point in uh in the um in the other data set so that was um, uh, what was this? Was it the non overlapping? Yeah, it was the non overlapping one. So, yep, that's it. Well, the, the pictures in the book. Uh, I thought I ran everything. Okay, that's the aggregation example. So that's next. Okay. Um, so the next the next one went into uh, went into spatial aggregation. So this was a, a way of uh, condensing the data and getting one one value back uh, for for a group. So doing means averages or or sums. Um, they equated this to a, you know, a, a non-spatial example um, that was back in in chapter three, and then they used the the other example again uh, with with New Zealand, and they aggregated the average value of the height for features. So they basically took all those um, elevation points and. Um, aggregated them so that they got the average um the average elevation for those different um those different polygon areas so the um the polygons that we saw earlier where they focused on this this canterbury and just the ones that intersected over here now they did the spatial aggregation of it and they got the average the average elevation of of all the points that fall within within uh within all these polygons here so um that uh you know another pretty uh typical function that you would uh you would get out of your your gis tools basically spatial aggregations Um, 
Okay. Congruence. Um, this is basically on the uh, the, the concept of um, shared borders versus not, not having a common border. So the previous example, I guess um, the uh, borders are all um, distinct. Um, but what they go through here is a is a more complex example where you've got some holes in your in your data. And I guess the example used was like um, if you have like a like an island nation, you know, a group of polygons and, or, you know, um, I could think, you know, maybe like uh, the Vatican inside of Italy is its own little hole, basically, because it's not part of the, the surrounding polygon. So they go into an example um, where the um, interpolate function kind of gives uh, a way to, to aggregate. And um, it was um, basically, you know, you get, you get a different value for the aggregation when everything is 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 congruent versus when you've got some when you've got some holes uh, in your data, but it applies a uh, a weighting uh, to in interpolate, I guess, uh, how to do how to do the average with the with the missing data. At least that's the way I, you know, th that's the way I interpreted it. You get two different values between the. Um, congruent or incongruent data set. So I didn't spend too much time uh, trying to really digest uh, this too much. So. Uh, and that should then um, um, distant, distance relations were, were covered next. Um, Basically, you know, being able to um, calculate the distance between between two points, and um, you always have units, and you can return a like a, a distance matrix, so you can find all the distances between you know uh, point X and and point Y. So that was given in a um, an example around. Um, I remember what it was. Let's see. Uh, distance, that's where we are. Distance relations. So, so the example. Um, The example was basically um, uh, what is this three three features, right? So you have the distance between um, all the different all the different features. Um, yeah, this one this one's eluding me a bit. Um, The height, the height example, and okay, so Otago can It's showing the distance between each pair of one object from the first from NZ and one object from, or one from NZ height and one from CO. So there's yes. um, each row corresponds to one of the things the three items from NZ height and each column is one of the items from CO and the entry there is the distance between them and because some of the heights are within um, OTAG then the OTAG yeah, then distance. the distance is zero right okay 
Yeah, I thought there was a better picture of that, but I don't remember. I don't remember seeing well, we it. Can, we can plot it, but yeah. It, visually, yeah. If you want, like, you can just, like, uh, go, like, in source and top left. And you can, or just here, tap, you can type it, like, if you... Yeah. inside of your junk if you want <laughs> yeah it's no need to do it now but like if you we can plot it basically if you want yeah well th these are the same regions right uh, yeah yeah it's the same region so you can map plot them. So it would it would show on that, that map of new zealand right yeah yeah you, have you three, can three height points and the height um and and co which is one county i think yeah, these two names, right? Cantor and, and Otag. Oh, it's well, two county then. Yeah. Okay. So I guess you can plot these two counties and plotting the point and see if it match. Mm -hmm. If we really want to do it now, but we can we can move on. <laughs> yeah. Try and save some time for the, the raster. raster. Yeah, which raster. is big. Right. So um Okay, so um, for, for the rasters, um, let's see. So we had um, um, subsetting with uh, clipping, clipping and masking and uh, adding and subtracting. Basically it said you can, you know, you can do basic, uh, you know, uh, math against the the raster layer, and you could add, subtract, you know, multiply um, any of the any of the values um, in the uh, in the raster. So there were some examples related to that um, uh, with uh, Figure four eleven, which um, just showed the. Um, let's see where we go. Uh, So basically, they're adding, you know, adding the uh, the elevation layers. Everything gets doubled. Everything gets squared. Take the the log of it, or filter for the values that are, um, you know, greater greater than five. So that should be figure four eleven, if I if I remember correctly. And then they go on to um, do. Um, a uh, example with a with a, a digital elevation model, and they basically take the the first raster layer of of the elevations, and they define a uh, what they call the reclassification matrix, which takes uh, ranges of the elevations and puts it into three groupings of of low, middle, and high, and then um, they basically, you know, um, convert it into um, the uh, the coded um, three three colors or three three different classifications based on the uh, the uh, putting the the elevation against the uh, reclassification matrix, and then um, they talk about the different different functions the. Uh, I guess it's a apply t t t apply l apply um, functions and and how they differ, and um, they used a l l apply or l app or app whatever it's called function for the uh, nd ndvi, which is a normalized uh, vegetation index uh, example. So. Uh, that was coming up over here, where you've got the you've got the elevation model, and then you've got the uh, the data for the um, the I guess it's like a tree tree canopy, and then the the shading for the vegetation index. Uh, you know, kind of shows you the more the more heavily treated uh, area in there. So that was using the uh, 
the um, that was the local example, I think. Yeah, it's local. Uh, I think it's a local operation. You do yeah, it on every pixel. Yeah, local local operation. Mm -hmm. And then um, example of a of a focal operation where you kind of have a moving um, um, pattern of a say a three by three rectangular matrix around the around the center cell, and you're doing calculations uh, based based upon the um, the uh, moving moving window. Basically, as you move through the uh, move through each cell, you're doing calculations um, around every that cell and all its all its neighbors up left, right, down. Um, so uh, let's see. That was um, the um, four four thirteen example. So that looked like. Um, that being the three by three moving window and recalculating each time you you slide um, you know cell cell by cell and um, I forget what they're calculating here. Um, but I just I think yeah, just an example. Uh, sometimes the window are called the kernel, so maybe you know them like uh, this way. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes they are called a kernel, which is the same kernel. ID. Yeah, yep. kernel is here. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, um. You, they are used a lot in image detection, like or edge detection. So, for example, if you want to detect edges, so there's plenty of uh, moving windows that do that. Algorithms that that's based on kernel that are doing like to detect edges and stuff like that. Not only just for like uh, remote sensing uh, or raster, but also for images. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, the, yeah, uh, local. Uh, let's say like uh, if you want to detect slope or stuff like that, also. I think this is example on top of my head. If also have example where they have used like moving windows. Okay. Um, so spatial filtering or convolution falls falls under that. Um, central focal kernel example uh the third the third method was with uh, zone, zonal operations and um usually used with uh categor categorical values and you get a you get a summary of you know for the for the categorical value or or zonal statistics is what was referred to uh in in GIS world, um, and then um, uh, global operations and distances is just a special case of of zones where everything is just for the one zone, and you just get back um, a descriptive descriptive statistic uh, for that zone. So used for calculating distance from each cell to a target cell. So um that could be similar to that uh, distance matrix uh discussion i guess right calculating distance from point a to to a to, to a target cell and let's see what their pictures here for uh zonal no i don't see the uh i think it was um, just like uh tab your some, uh... Yeah. Yeah, so here was the uh, like the categorical variable variable where they um, had I guess soil soil samples soil density um, and they have the three categories clay clay silt or sand and I could, probably like a boring example where they took a, a soil boring and at a certain elevation or depth they've you know based on the uh, the raster data, they were able to group it into uh, into these three uh, categorical uh, values with the zonal operation and the other, we did that one zonal and 
And the global one covered, um, let's see, no real, no real example here from, from what I saw. Yeah. I guess you have to go a little deeper. Just, yeah, for, this is just a summary statistic of all the value possible. Like, what what is interesting is like uh, on the zonal one, you can change the here they use the mean. But I assume if you want, you can use the mean, the max or other function, mm -hmm. which can be useful. Like if you are like, um, let's say you, play, even if this a uh, soil example, you could want like ask the question, like what is uh, inside of my rasters, the minimum eleva eleva elevation where I found clay or here, yeah, like what you say, what you see is basically like the mean of every point that have clay, uh, silt, and sand, but you could want like instead of the min, you could want like I don't know uh, <laughs> the minimum of the maximum. Some other like question you you may or may be interested in, and it's it's just changing the function, the fun argument. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that mentioned somewhere about uh, about. Yeah, it's it's also possible like in the aggregate function. The aggregate can take us also a function. Yeah, I think we covered that, right? Yeah, yeah. different description, right? Different description. Dis oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, You're right. It's yeah. Min min max, yeah, as well. You can. Mm -hmm. Um. So, the uh, only other thing I I covered a little bit was the um. Uh, section try to compare um, the different functions um, between you know uh, for a raster versus its its vector vector processing counterparts. So um, I kind of went through it and I you know these for these three functions and just kind of put it into a little a little summary table. So when computing a, a distance, the uh, global operation on raster is um, aligned with doing a uh, buffering around uh, vector data. And if you're going to do uh, like a reclassifying like that example with um, the categorical um, variables, uh, lo local or zonal, uh, that got equated to uh, dissolving um, boundaries uh, in a vector example and an overlay for a local raster function was similar to a uh, a clipping a clipping operation um, you know uh, done, done on uh, vectors. So I kind of you know just absorbed this little um, uh, section here about the uh, different counterparts. Or for vector processing, and just uh, summarized it in that in that uh, little tabular format there. So there wasn't too much content there, but I thought that that's what they were trying to you know get out of there to say that for a lot of these raster functions, you can think of them and you know what their similar vector processing counterpart was. And then just some stuff at the end on merging, just some notes about uh, the tariff merge function. And um, when you combine two images, if you try to merge rasters, if they overlap, you we use the values of the, the, first, the first raster. And that sometimes the mosaic function would be better uh, when putting two or more spectral imagery raster layers together. So there wasn't too much, um, you know, discussion on uh, down down here, just, um, you know, a couple of little uh, discussion points and, and examples. So at right. that point, I was pretty much, uh, It's a big chapter <laughs> in, in, yeah, in pretty deep, uh, in pretty deep at that point. So that's, 
That's right. my uh, that's my summary. I'm not sure where the other little. Um, so, does anyone like have question or want to? No one. <laughs> no, great. It's it's, it's it's a huge chapters. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, you know, like I have this um, <laughs> this discussion and and uh, ongoing discussion with one of the authors on the distances, and the question is like it's not always clear if you want to use st within distance or if you prefer to buffer. Like what you said, like for example, like it's a buffering uh, when you want to test. And as, what does ST within distance is basically you could also do a buffer on one object and then uh, do an intersect. You know, like this is, uh, and that's what you write, uh, this, is a, this is a buffer operation. And sometimes, and I can't explaining, the buffer way is quicker <laughs> than uh, using the stay within distance, which I think makes sense because the stay within distance, we calculate a bunch of distances and then uh, it will filter on the distance you want. While if you do a buffer, you do not do the buffer for every distances. You will do a buffer for one distances, then intersect. But you know, it's like this, uh, when you are doing this operation, like there is this trade-off Especially like if you are not doing in a trivial amount of points, you know, like not, not three points or like, if you do on a, a bunch of points or a bunch of polygon, there was always a question of like, if I do within the distance, if I use like ST within distance, or if I calc every distance, then filters, isn't it better to buffer some places than intersect or using the ST within distance? So this is like, I do not have answer to it and I, uh, my experience is a lot of time it's better to use a buffer or multiple buffer than uh, sometimes calculating distances. It depends on what you want to do, obviously, but it's a it's an interesting like um, uh, you know it's basically the same. You will get the same results or nearly the same results because a buffer does not exactly draw like a perfect boundary. Uh, you know, it's just like uh, it have to assume like uh, if you if you if you zoom on a, a point like you buffer, you will see like it's not a perfect round. It's it's simplified the uh, the shape. So sometimes it matters, but yeah, that's my small anecdote and experience about it. I prefer buffering, but could be wrong. I don't know if others like use ST within distance or just buffer. The old way. Okay. No one wants to. So yeah, I also point like I write a, a small blog post on uh, the DE nine wine mattresses, uh, which basically like goes through like when you do an ST relate. You basically generate this string for every couple of options, and then you filter with the, um, the string you want. So this is how it works. And one point that's maybe important to mention, and it's a trick that's commonly used, uh, at least in R. And I think like I want, I mean, it's the idea like so, uh, with this binary predicate or, or predicate, not by you, what you can generate is like as the full matrices, all the sparse binary matrices. I think that touched that in the book. Uh, let me go into it. Azure uh, computation with R. Uh, but, 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 sparse. Um, and sometimes what you want to do, um, or is it? Uh, let me just check sparse here. Yes, it's it's subsetting. Uh, maybe I will share my screen quickly. Where is it? Yeah, yes. Uh, so it's a nice trick to to remember. I will zoom, and I will free you. <laughs> uh, share screen. Here. Share. 
Okay, yeah, you see like, you, you basically like uh, can generate, so they go into detail here. I agree with you, like they, they take like the very, very slow approach, but here it's kind of stupid. You see like uh, you want to generate the sparse matrices, uh, which will basically return as a one or empty. Like, remember we are in this example, like where you have like a summate height uh, into uh, New Zealand. And we are lucky that none of these summer, uh, none of these high peak are in the middle of the borders. If they were in the middle of the border, we will, instead of having like zero or whatever one, we'll have others, uh, we will have the index of the other one. So instead of having like a list with either empty or one, we could have a list with two elements. Uh, and the tr this trick is very useful. <laughs> this this simple trick is very useful because sometimes here it's simple. You just filter by zero by the empty, but sometimes you can have stuff that intersects with more than one, and then the sparse binary predicate will return uh, an uh, the list with n elements, and the element will be like the indices of what you are returning. And you can like then like let's say you want just want like uh, sometimes the question is like uh, you just want like, I think I have an example of it. Let's see, do I have an example of it here? No, let here say like did you see like I have an example? Maybe you just want the cases where you return two elements because this is what you are interested. Then you can filters uh, instead of uh, see this is my my, my example was stupid. I mean, my stupid, it was like this, this square. And you want to know how they interact and um, intersect with each other. And you see like there are some who just touch on the borders, some touch on the borders and on the length, and some uh, like are, are sharing a, a bonder, um interior. And if you do like the um, sterilate with uh, just like sharing uh, uh, a point, you get more results. So you have the one that's match the one and the four, obviously, and the four that's match the one and the four. That they are symmetric. Uh, that makes sense. Um, and then sometimes you just want to filter them. Then in, you can take this uh, sparse binary object, which is a list of an element, and filter inside of filter from zero or one. You can filter for two. And then it will just extract uh, this to one. So this is like a, a useful trick also. Uh, that's, uh, that's a trick that is useful when you understand like what's behind the, um, this binary predicate. You can uh, do a bit more powerful stuff that can save you times, help you debug. Like if I go back to the book, uh, imagine like a, uh, a peak is on two borders. You can, you can just, inside of uh, asking, by the way, remember this is an S here because like you are asking the length, not just the length uh, on uh, every uh, object on the list, on every list object. And you can ask uh, inside, you can equal equal to, and then it will just highlight the place where uh, you have like this peak on the border. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> so it's it's, it's it's very, it's I agree it's technical but sometimes it will uh, uh, be powerful enough that it saves you a lot of work. And yeah, it's 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 a lot of I do not know if Arc, ArcGIS offer that and I have not using ArcGIS. Uh, my last time I was using it was what. It was the eight version, so imagine. So I uh, probably not have using like for the last 20, uh, no, maybe 15 years. <laughs> I don't know when was like the eight version, but yeah. So um, I don't know if ArcGIS offer you like this flexibility. I do not remember, probably, but it's, I do not know where. Okay. Uh, do we Thank have you, someone? Tony. What? Do we have Thank someone? You. Yeah, bye. Do we have 
do we have someone for next week? Yeah, I volunteered next week and we'll be going over maybe the more geometrical aspects of some of our data formats, both SF and raster, and talking probably more about all these um, internal mathematics of the intersections and whatnot. Oh, perfect. So more of it. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone. And thanks a lot, Tony, for this presentation. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, just um, I guess Jim was trying to guide me with the uh, with the GitHub and the um, yeah. So if I basically uh, take his latest and then just try to merge in my notes, is that kind of we just keep forwarding it along, just like adding each chapter? Is that is that the point? I don't want to try it because I don't want to lose all my data. <laughs> Are you, uh, with Git, you will not lose anything. This was meant for not losing anything. I, if you to, know what you're doing, yes. <laughs> if you're hacking, do you want right? me to to go to go uh, uh, with it on that? I can I can just do it right now and share my screen. Yeah, I think he he basically said I had to what sync. I had to sync the uh, fork that was um, yeah. first. You need to sync. Then you need to pull. Then you need to push. It may be complicated. That's that's a lot of jargon. So if you want, I can do it, uh, and you can try to do it at the same time. What do you think? Uh, I'll, I'll take a shot at it offline. I, I, okay. It's, it's so the, my... the basic the basic idea is like what you are writing on your computers. You will use Git commit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have the the desktop, the graphical. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you have the 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 desktop of like you know like this. Uh, I can show you. Like I have one. Uh, yeah, the, the GitHub desktop. I I just didn't. The, the... No, uh, you have like as did you have one? Like let me show you. Uh, I didn't take the version yet that had Jim's but, chapter three in it. Right? Did, did you did you have like did you uh uh? I just had your slide. I just had your your template slide. That's what I grabbed. Oh, okay. But you so copy now, past it, or did you like pull it from GitHub? Um, there's plenty of way of doing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd have to look. Um, but I have a local but, copy basically that was your slide. Yeah, you have right, where you set I'd up like, the template, and then since then, I think chapters one, two, and three have been yeah. added to it. So I yeah. gotta pull down okay. chapters one, two, and three and just add chapter four, right? M yes. Maybe. If if you've not built the whole book, um, maybe it'd be best to hand the R mark down to someone who can build the book. Um, that's fine too. Happy to help out either way. Yeah, um, yeah you can like I can show you quickly like on our studio. Like it will be maybe useful to show you that. It will be yeah. like not long. Um, sure. Okay. I, I will share like my screen another time. It's it's on my work, but that's fine. Who cares? Uh, where is it? Zoom. Share screen. So here I have an air studio open. I'm doing a, it's an air markdown too. Okay, See? Can I, thank you. Yeah, you can go back. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Right. Thank I will you. just show you quickly. So here on air studio, you have like a git also. Do you mm -hmm. have it? Yeah. Uh-huh. So you have like, what you basically need to do is like, uh, you need to first stage it, which is just in studio, just click on something. Then you can check the differences if you want, but it's not needed. I mean, it's good. It's a good practice to see what's the difference you have done, basically. Uh, yeah, it's, it's SQL, I think. So it's not very sexy. Uh, and, um, then you can commit it and here like it will appear it will also like do the recap you write a nice message and then you commit here okay yeah and this is not down <laughs> uh, and then you push it here okay i'll take a look at what uh but for that, you need to have like, uh, so here, let, let's see. I have my terminal here. And here my, I, I update it, sure. Uh, 
Okay, bye. Here you need to have Git initialized, but if you have, if you do not have that, it's fine. Just send, just put your air markdown file in Slack, or if you want to learn it, I can show you like from from scratch. It's not difficult, but it's very mm, jargonish. Like you have a lot of words like push, commit, stage, yep. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I've been, I've been playing around with it and, and learning it, but I, I just didn't want to screw anything up. Um, you will so. never screw anything. <laughs> with, with Git, it's perfectly safe. No worries. All right. I'll take a look. Derek posted okay. some notes, I think. Um, okay. On the uh, offer data science thing. So I'll take a look there, see what I could do. I, if not, I'll just put it in. Here's the chapter four, please. Uh, yeah. We will do learn. Merge it in, okay? Yeah, but it's you know if you do it, it's on your name. All right, I'll try. Yes, thanks a lot. All right, and good, good job. Bye. Yeah, thank you.